The peace of Christ be with you. For those of you who are just joining us, we are working our way through Paul's epistles to the Christians in Rome. We are in chapter 15 this week, so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to pull them out and turn to chapter 15. There's only 16 chapters in this letter, which suggests to us we're getting down to the very, very end. Paul's letter has been described as the cathedral of the Christian faith. Each verse is like a stained glass window that allows the light from true light to illuminate the darkness within so that it might give us a vision for how to live without. Hear the word of the Lord as it comes from Paul in chapter 15. We'll be reading through verse 13. 15, 1. We who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up our neighbor. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. So, Whatever has been written in previous days has been written for our instruction so that by steadfastness and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together with one voice, you may glorify our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another. Therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the blessings promised to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God by his mercy. As it is written, Therefore, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise you. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come. The one who rises to rule the Gentiles and in him, the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. It's almost time. Like sand through an hourglass, the year's almost over. Do you realize after tonight we have only two more gatherings together and then we're done? For some of you, this is a great relief. <laughs> For some other of you, it triggers other kinds of emotions. It's almost the end of the year before we launch into that wide open country we call summer vacation. But for some of you, it won't be launching into a vacation. For some of you, it might be launching into a job or May term, more studies, maybe being a camp counselor. For some of you, you will be graduated from this prestigious institution we call Hope, and you will be what we lovingly call in the advancement office, alumni. You'll be graduates. Some of you, in a couple weeks, are gonna launch off from here north, and south, and east, and west. It's almost time. Whatever you're doing, the normal day-to-day -day is gonna change. And sometimes when change happens, it can trigger lots of different kinds of emotions. Sometimes change triggers excitement, and sometimes it triggers fear. But almost always, in one form or another, change, transition, can trigger anxiety that sense of unease, of the unknowing. 
You know that the currents are taking you around the bend, but you can't see around that bend. And you don't know if it's rapids or a waterfall or a gentle, calm spring. You don't know what the future holds. And when you don't know, it can trigger anxiety. There's lots of feelings that can happen in a transition at an end. Because every end, as you know, is also a new beginning. Anxiety is one of those things that I've struggled with a lot in my life. I didn't always know that it was anxiety, but it is. It was. It continues to be. When I was a little boy, I was anxious about, well, I was anxious about a lot of things. I had a hard time reading. I had a lift. I used to say my S's like this. And I didn't like to speak publicly at all. (laughs) That's when God said, ha ha. I thought I was dumb. I was anxious that I was stupid. And I channeled that anxiety into heart more and more work. When I was a little older, my parents were going through a real hard time and I was anxious about my family. There was a season when my dad had clinical depression and he was hospitalized for about six months and I was 14 years old. And I was anxious for him. I, I love my father, I want my father to be happy. So I thought if I, if I could be a good son, if I could get good grades, if, if we could win more games, then maybe he'd be proud and maybe he would be happy and it put me on this treadmill of achievementron. I gotta do more, I gotta be more. Every test and every game, my identity was at stake. But not only identity, but my dad's happiness. I didn't know all that was going on, but it was going on, and I was anxious. And then it was time to choose a college, and I was anxious about that. And then it was time to choose a major, and I was anxious about that. It was time to choose a vocation, and I was anxious about that. And then I had to figure out, would anyone love me? Would I ever get married? And I was anxious about that. You go to grad school and you start a dissertation. Are you smart enough to make it? Will you ever finish that? By God's grace, a woman did love me. Her name is Kristen. It was a really good day. (laughs) I was on a bench. I'll tell you it later. (laughs) But we got married. And I thought that would solve all these other kinds of anxieties that plagued my life, but it, it just, it, there were just more kinds of anxieties now. Now, um, we wanted to start a family, and that wasn't easy for us, and that created anxiety. And by God's grace, God blessed us with two little kids, Trigvi, who's junior, who's about four years old, and Ella, who's 22 months, but like 18 already. And now I have all these kinds of anxieties as a father. Will I, will I, be, will I be wise enough for them? Will I know what, what to do? Will, what will happen to them? I, I, don't, I, won't, I won't always be there for them. Right now, Ella is just 22 months and I can hold her, but I know, I know that just in a short amount of time, she's gonna be sitting right there or someplace. <laughs> and I won't be there. And I'm filled with anxiety about that. I get anxious about the ministry. Will, will you like me? Will people come to the gathering or chapel? Will I get to keep my job? And, um, I get anxious. It's just marked my life. And some people work with anxiety. They, they, they find addictions of some kind to mask it. And, and some other people, it's a control issue. For me, I self-medicate with food and um, work. I just work. When I get anxious, I just work more all the time. And because I'm anxious a lot, I work a lot. I also eat a lot. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm anxious all the time, it seems to me. Just because I, I'm a Christian and I love the Lord Jesus and I love the gospel, it doesn't take away that anxiety sometimes. What do we do with these feelings of anxiety or those feelings you carry with you and you just don't know what to do? Well, I've learned that you know, there's some common sense 
ways of dealing with anxiety, like, you know, diet and exercise and rest. Those are all good things. Usually, uh, once every two, three weeks, I get this meeting. Billy Bob Vandersmith comes to make an appointment with me, and he says, Trey, I'm just so anxious. I said, Billy Bob, can I ask a, a, a diagnostic question? He said, yeah, man. Go ahead. I said, well, when was the last time you slept and had a decent meal? And Billy Bob's like, man, I've been up for like 31 hours straight. I've been drinking Red Bull and coffee, and I've eaten nothing but pizza, and I haven't been outside that whole time listening nonstop to the soundtrack of Frozen. <laughs> and I'm like, Billy Bob, I love you, brother, but you're not actually anxious. You're just strung out. What you need is a detox. And I get out a sheet of paper and I get all authoritative and I write, sleep, eat a full meal, drink water, go for a walk outside, tear it off and hand it to him. All right, in three weeks, I want you to, I want you to give me a call. More often than not, no one comes back to me. Healthy, healthy rhythms can help ease anxiety. But there are times also when that isn't good enough, that, that just doesn't cut it. There are real deep anxieties and Sometimes we need a professional, somebody who's really trained to listen, a counselor or a psychologist, somebody who can really help us untangle all those knots inside. I've had the good fortune of, of benefiting from that kind of ministry from people, and it's really, really important. And sometimes it's, it's not just having somebody listen. Sometimes there's other kinds of help. Medications can help. My father, who I mentioned, suffers from clinical depression, which isn't just feeling bad or low or having low self-esteem. It's actually a chemical imbalance in the brain, which means that there are medications that can help him, and that's helped. The helpings helped. These are all ways we can handle anxiety, but there's often a way that I think Christians, in the midst of all of these good options, and these are all open to all Christians everywhere, but one of the ways we can deal with anxiety, I think, goes unnoticed or unnamed. And I want to name it as we reach the end of the year, as we have a couple more weeks together. One of the ways we can deal with anxiety is, or feelings we don't know what to do with is, we, is pray. Christians are a praying people. We pray to God and we pray for each other. Paul says this in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul commends to the Christians, to the church, to you and to me, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests be made known to God. We pray for each other. It's one of the things that we do. It's one of the ways that we walk in harmony with one another is to pray. To glorify God with one voice, we pray. To please our neighbor and to build up our neighbor, one of the things we can do is we can simply pray for them. Have you ever had a friend or been a friend who prays for another I mean, like, really pray. About two weeks ago, I sent an email out to about four close friends, friends who know me really well. And I was just, I was facing something, feeling something that I just knew I need to get outside of my head and I need to get outside of my immediate community and ask some brothers who know me and love me to pray for me. There was something I needed discernment about. What it is isn't so important as it is um, a week later, I got a random email from my friend T. I call him Mr. T. T is short for uh, Thomas Gatewood III. His son is Thomas Gatewood IV. It's a long, prestigious line. I like to call him Mr. T. Mr. T is my best friend from grad school and probably knows me as well as anyone. And he gave me a call. And T is a pastor of a small church in in Banner Elk, North Carolina, a small little church hanging on the edge of a mountain. 
beautiful place, beautiful people. T went for a walk in the woods with the precise intent just to pray for me. Pray for my brother Trig. Pray for Kristen. T knows that I struggle with some of that anxiety sometimes. And he went to prayer for me. And he called me up and he said, hey, I just want you to know, while I was walking, I had this overwhelming vision for you. What that vision is isn't necessarily so important right now, but what he had to say to me was the very word of God I needed to hear that day. And I was able to hear it because I had a friend who was willing to pray. Just simply really pray for me, intercede for me in the name of Jesus. And I tell you what, I felt this weight come off my shoulders. It was overwhelming to have a friend who would just pray for me. We're called to be those kinds of friends for each other. One of the ways we deal with crippling anxiety or fear or the unknown of change and transition is to pray, to pray for each other. Now, prayer is one of those kinds of things too that it's easy to take for granted. No one ever really sometimes takes the time to teach us how to pray, who to pray to, what to pray for, what makes prayer effective, how is prayer manifested into action and somehow. Prayer is one of those things that can easily be used as a trite band-aid, where I'll pray for you, an escape hatch from reality. But prayer, real prayer, is about pressing into reality. Real prayer is about acknowledging that we are all dependent on the living God and allowing our lives to be taken seriously before the throne. And so we pray for each other. But it's not always easy to know who to pray to, what to pray for, or what makes it effective. One of the things that I want to encourage us is to pray the very words of Scripture. If you don't know how to pray and you have a friend that you want to pray for and you're not sure exactly what to pray, I commend to you Scripture. Let the Word guide your words. Let the spirit of Scripture shape your syntax and your syllables. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes in his classic book, Life Together, the most promising way to pray is to allow yourself to be guided by the very words of the Bible, to let the words of Scripture guide you. In this way, you will not fall prey to your own emptiness. One of the ways we pray is to pray back scripture. I've been praying for you this week as I've been working on this sermon. And one of the scriptures that's jumped out to me that I've been praying for has kind of caught in me so much that I just want to uplift it to you, to take with you these final few weeks at Hope College. It's verse 13. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there, or you can just listen to me. Here's the prayer at the end of this section that Paul offers his brothers and sisters in Rome. Paul says this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is my prayer for you. This is what I hope that you take with you when you leave this summer. Wherever you go, north or south or east or west, this prayer right here, the wisdom, the morrow of this text, eat it up and let it get into your bloodstream until it metabolizes into acts of love, into a joyful faith that erupts, maybe even in a library that sings hallelujah so that other people standing by who don't know may know there is a joy, that there is a peace. Get this in you so that you might know that there is an assurance that will grip you and never, ever let you go. In fact, let's learn it tonight, shall we? Let's pray. Let's pray the very words of the Bible. Verse 13, repeat after me. Let's memorize this together. I say it and you repeat back to me. May the God... 
May the God, may the God of hope, hope, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, joy and peace, peace and joy. In believing, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So that that you may abound, abound, abound in hope, in hope by the power, power, more power. Of the Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. May the God of hope hope fill you with all joy and peace peace in believing believing. so that you may abound abound in hope hope by the power power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Take this and make it your own. Pray into it with the deep, deep faith of authenticity. Groove this deep into the contours of your soul that at some time in some place, when you are in the darkness, when you can't hear anything, you can hear the word of scripture. This is a lovely, beautiful little prayer that teaches us who to pray to and what to pray for and what makes prayer effective. It teaches us who to pray to. May the God of hope. We don't pray for prayer's sake. We don't pray to a generic, nameless God, some deity out there in the void, some generic love. We pray to the God of hope. Have you ever noticed that I begin the gathering the same way every week? It's not because I'm not creative or that there isn't other options. I actually do it intentionally. I come out every week and I say, welcome, in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I do this so that if we don't get anything else right that night, if the music is just off key or the sermon is an iron dove that just falls to the floor flat and can't fly, at least, at least, We've heard the name of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the three in one, the God revealed in the Holy Scriptures. I believe so powerfully in just saying the name of God that something can happen, will happen, and does happen. We don't make God happen. God is always happening, and he happens often when his name is honored and hallowed. Hallowed be his name. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The God of hope. Of hope. One of the big themes of the book of Romans. Lo, the entire scripture is hope. Hope is a vision of the future. Hope is the ability to see past the darkness of the night and into the bright light of a fresh new dawn. Hope is being able to see that you have a preferred future and that future has many exciting options. Hope is the ability to know that no matter what circumstances you're in right now, no matter how much it feels like the anxiety is choking you, that That circumstance does not have the final word. The God of hope, the God of hope is who we pray to. And this God has always been enacting a future for a people. In the very beginning, God says, let there be light, and there was light, and it was good, it was beautiful. God's word creates reality. He creates all things, all things that we study here at Hope College have some correspondence back to this God of hope, which is why we joyfully go into the classroom and unafraid to ask any kind of question. 
Because this God is a God who takes all these questions into himself. God makes a people. And though these people have fallen away, God chose from the primordial beginning of time to have a people and makes a covenant. God makes a promise, and that promise is echoing down the canyons of time. That promise grips the people and brings the people out of slavery, gives them a land that is preferred, makes sure that they are provided for when they are hungry and when they are thirsty, gave them a place, gave them a history, gave them an identity. All the promises of the patriarchs are fulfilled through this covenant promise till it culminates into a moment in time when God comes and puts on flesh and walks among us and does for us what we could not do for ourselves. His life, his death, his resurrection and ascension become the ground of our hope. He pours out his Holy Spirit and makes a new people, people from every tribe and language and nation, even a people at the ends of the earth in Holland, Michigan, gathered in a little Indiana limestone chapel named Dibnet, making a people called Hope. God is always acting in history to bring hope, and hope means that you have a future, you have options. May the God of hope Our prayer has a subject and an object. We direct our prayers to God. That's who we pray to. But this verse also teaches us what to pray for. That we may abound in joy and peace in believing that we may abound in hope. If you have somebody you need to pray for, I want to pray that you pray specifically that they have joy and peace in believing. Joy and peace. I'm a broody, edgy Norwegian, which means that my default dispensation isn't always happy-go-lucky. I can live on the dark side of the moon sometimes. And I need help sometimes with joy. That's why I love my assistant, Lori Bauman. If you meet Lori Bauman, this woman is filled with gospel joy. To be a Christian is to be unapologetically joyful. And sometimes in the church, we think that to have an authentic faith means that we carry the burdens of the world so much that we have a furrowed brow and we're always anxious and that to be intellectually honest means that we have to have some kind of emo cult dispensation where our hair is always rustled and our shirts are untucked and we're too cool to care. Right? That ain't Christian joy. Christian joy sometimes means we got to put ourselves together and face the day and say, day, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed, and I love the Lord. Be joyful. Don't be unapologetically joyful and to have peace. Peace that sometimes seals so elusive. Pray for your friends that God would give us joy and peace in believing. What makes joy and peace possible is the believing Believing not in an esoteric God, believing not in a systematic particular doctrine, but believing in the gospel. The gospel of the Son, Jesus Christ, who was descended from David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. To believe in the Jesus who is resurrected from the dead. Because of Jesus' resurrection means that we have a preferred future of hope. To put all of your trust in the gospel and never, ever to be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation for all who believe. Because to believe in this gospel means that you have a future where nothing can ever, ever separate you from the love of God. No matter what you've done, no matter what you're anxious about, no matter what guilt you're carrying around, the gospel says this, Jesus Christ covers your sins and you are forgiven right now. Right now. You are declared in faith in Jesus to be righteous right now. 
It means that Jesus right now is at the right hand of God interceding for you in your life. It means that no matter what you are going to faith, when you launch out of Hope College, north or south or east or west, there is a God of hope interceding and praying for you. It means that you have a future always, always, which is why Paul says that if you have the joy and peace in believing, you may abound in hope. One translation says to overflow with hope. Hope, the God of hope. To abound in hope is to abound in God. To have God is to have hope. What we hope for you when you leave here isn't that you have a degree merely. We do hope that. But more than that, we hope that you will take that degree and embody hope, the hope of the gospel. The gospel made power, made possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. What makes prayer possible isn't us doing more or being more or pulling ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps, but the gift of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The mark and sign of the Holy Spirit upon us is a people of hope, a people marked by joy and a people marked by peace, which is why Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests be made known to God. You don't have to be anxious anymore. You can pray and hope that things can be different because they are. The God of hope is here tonight. I don't know if there's a better name for a Christian college, heck, just a college, than hope. Hope is the knowledge, the assurance, the trust that you have a future. This table calls us to be a people of hope, nourish us for a life of hope. Here, the power of the Holy Spirit is calling us into a deeper, deeper life with God. That no matter what you face in life, no matter what circumstances you're in, no matter what decision you've got before you, you don't need to be anxious because this table reminds us of God's real presence, that God is with us and that God is for us. Friends, we want to invite you to the table tonight because this is the table of hope.